Welcome to our closing session. Thanks everyone in the room who stayed with us. Really appreciate your attention. Um, at our opening, uh, opening session on Wednesday night, I mentioned that our goal for the conference is to be informative, thought provoking, and fun. Uh, and based on all the feedback we've received, I think we delivered on our goal, didn't we? Yeah, okay. So before we start our panel, I'd like to give a big shout out and thanks to our new head of marketing and communications, Elizabeth Walden. Where are you, Elizabeth? Oh. Uh, Elizabeth just recently joined the team and she's been leading all of this in partnership with our incredible event coordinator, Christina Ferner. Where are you, Christina? She's probably still out there organizing everything. Um, and then there's been a ton of other people that have been helping us, many colleagues across CAQH, uh, Jen Lux, uh, Kelly Rose, Ann Buff, Elizabeth Nazarin, and so many others. And then, of course, I want to give some special recognition um, to uh, Pete and Sam uh, for all the hard work you all have done up here on the stage. I really appreciate it. Pete Jobs. Sorry, Pete Jobs. Um, so I am so honored to be on the stage with Brian and Ashley and Dr. Beveridge. I've known all these folks for a while now. Brian and I go way back. I judged an innovation challenge at Accenture almost 10 years ago when we first met and just did another one recently. And then Dr. Beveridge I worked with at Humana and had an incredible time with him, really transforming healthcare, slowing disease progression, doing all kinds of great things in chronic conditions. And then of course, Ashley, who's just joined us as the new chief product officer at CAQH. Ashley and I worked together at Highmark and also did some really amazing things in transforming the experience in the care delivery system in Pittsburgh. So I can't thank you all enough for joining us today to close out uh, this session. So let's jump into it. Um, we all know, despite our best efforts, even efforts by CAQH, administrative burden and cost is increasing. Uh, based on the research done through our CAQH index last year, hopefully you all know about the index and you get that and you read it because there's amazing information in there about how we've done with healthcare administration cost reduction and still what more the U.S. needs to do around that. And we do know that there are certain specialties that bear more burden than others. Some of those specialties like behavioral health providers and cardiologists. That means that these providers in particular are spending more time on administrative work and that probably means less time on the care to the patients that need them. So although medical and administrative costs continue to rise, we know the US population is not getting any healthier. healthier. Um, I've had many conversations over, over the past few days and bottom line, I think we all agree, at least in this room, and even when I go out and talk to other people, that we are not moving fast enough or far enough. And so there's much more work for us to do in transforming healthcare. So I'm gonna start off with a, a pretty heavy question. I hope you all are ready for this. In my 30 years in healthcare, I've seen so many different healthcare administration problems. Some have been solved, and some still require some more transformational solutions. What do you believe to be the most important healthcare administration problem in the United States? And what do you think the real root cause is? Who wants to go first? That's not a softball. I know. Here, <laughs> here, I'll go first. But I, I need to have an act, and uh, we'll try this out. Hey, I'm on stage at a healthcare conference, and I really need some help. I want to understand what do you believe to be the most important healthcare administration problem in the US today? The most important healthcare administrative problem in the US today? I'd say it's prior authorization. Great, can you say that like a pirate? Arr, tis prior authorization, the scurvy dog slowing us down, matey. Great, so we'll go with that one as a start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, any more? Yeah. So, the three of us can step down and we just do <laughs> chat GPT. Is that what we're going to do here? Yes. That, I mean, that was, uh, yeah, I was like, I was just That's needed good. some help there. So, yeah. Well, I, I would say, and this is not going to be a direct answer, the biggest problem is any problem that flows through and touches the patient or in the case of a payer, the customer. And so I 
I kind of look at the system at large and how all of these problems that are really driving administrative burden on the clinician, um, working harder and harder to meet all of these requirements while still providing exceptional care. But if all of these things are also causing friction for the patient, all of this effort is going to still lead to not hitting those health outcomes and those shared goals between that patient and that clinician because they aren't empowered to actually take those actions that they need to in their health. And so, you know, something like interoperability um, and not having really the information we need across the system, what that's doing is creating maybe in a best case scenario, a spot where a patient has to be an advocate for their own information and care. We heard Erin describe that in her experience uh, this morning in the panel, uh, first thing today. Um, they might need to do essentially their own care management and manage their own care plan or even just repeat themselves over and over again in order to really just make sure they are advocating for themselves. But the next level of that challenge is if the interoperability isn't there, they're paying more, they're getting duplicative services, and at the worst of it, they're actually completely disengaged. So through all of that challenge, really 44% of Americans say that they don't trust the healthcare system. Through all of that challenge, they are not persevering, and they're actually choosing not to seek the care because they're disenfranchised by the system. So to me, I know it's a long way around the topic, but I think all of these burdens are actually meaning that people aren't responding to care in the ways that the clinicians are working so hard to drive toward. I agree with you. I think it's engagement, just kind of simplifying it. Um, you know, it's, it's a very complicated, complex system, uh, as you described. And, um, but in some ways, that doesn't surprise me so much in terms of how complex the system is. If you think back to uh, 1940, we had no antibiotics. We had no medicines for behavioral health medicine. We had no treatment for congestive heart failure. The treatment for people in the 1960s with heart failure was digitalis, which is a plant extract, and bed rest. So things didn't have to be very complicated through the 60s and 70s because we had no chemotherapy drugs. We, we didn't have anything. So to be a good doctor in my generation was pretty easy. It's like you just show up. It was great. <laughs> it's a lot harder now, you know? And that's, that's, you know, that has introduced all this complexity. And the banking industry's figured a lot of stuff out. You know, we're, we're a little bit behind. I'll, I'll build up that and add one more. So I'll add a human one to this versus just uh, what I got from ChatGPT. I would also add clinical documentation when you've got, you know, a third of time from a given nurse or clinician being spent document, documenting stuff that takes away from patient care, as you mentioned, as well. And I know that also you had the question, part two of what's the real root cause. Mm -hmm. it build, I build off one of the things you said, Ashley. I'll just use the acronym SIR. So one would be standards, incentives, as well as regulatory. So on standards, I would say standards adopts, adoption as well as just advancing those. Incentives, just misaligned incentives related to how things work. And then on regulatory, just the compliance and all the paperwork needed to keep that going can be tough. Aaron, I bet you're really excited to hear that, right? Yeah. Standards. Standards, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Anything else? Good. Yeah. Moving on? Okay. Okay, so at this conference and every day, we talk a lot about transforming healthcare and how AI and machine learning can help us solve all these healthcare administration problems and reduce cost and burden on providers. What do you believe this technology can actually do for us? And what are the limitations and some of the concerns about losing the human connection? This is your I'm happy to say, yeah. <laughs> I was, um, so one, what, if I were to just talk generally about what AI can do for us, one, it's, AI isn't new, it's here now, and it's been here for some time. 
capabilities, it gives us the ability to both diagnose, figure out what did happen, predict what could happen, and then now generate. So generally, you know, we have those capabilities. Why that is exciting, and specifically the new generative piece is interesting, is when you look at both um, health insurance as well as care delivery, roughly 40% of tasks have the potential to be automated and augmented using either good old-fashioned artificial intelligence or the new generative AI wave. However, there's a problem with that. That's potential, not realized. To actually realize that potential, you have to both reinvent work, reshape the workforce, and prepare workers. That is hard to do. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of potential, a lot of interest, but it's gonna take a lot of work to ultimately realize that potential. I would add, uh, I feel like a lot of the focus is on how can we actually use generative AI and AI tools to impact these discrete administrative needs. Um, I actually wanna turn it toward the payer's responsibility in that equation because um, I'm fresh from a payer and I see that there's really the basics that we aren't great at yet that are essentially driving administrative challenges into the provider system that maybe aren't as logically tied into the solutions that we've been talking about. So, you know, my role prior to uh, my six days at CAQH um, was focused more on that um, in front of the curtain member and provider experience, those front doors into engaging um, with the payer. And what I really saw was that those basics, like finding the right care, understanding your benefits, um, really getting to cost transparency, all of these elements are actually then creating downstream impacts of questions not answered, seeking care in not the right places. And some of these opportunities, I think we, we look at AI like it's gotta be the, these incredibly complex future looking use cases. I, I thought that the talk yesterday about the terrible twos and where we are in this journey on AI was fantastic because it pointed out that First, it's about understanding language. That technology is great at understanding questions and then coming back with knowledge that's worded in ways that people can understand. And I think at the root of much of what people are struggling with is they have questions that they can't get answers to. So if we could take that basic technology and not look 10 years in the future, but instead look right in front of us at what are those basic needs that people have, they wanna know, do I need care? Where can I get it? From who? What's it gonna cost me? Those are all key questions that honestly I feel like people aren't gonna care if that question they're asking a machine or a person. If they can get a simple answer, that's really gonna help them and it's going to reduce downstream calls, care sought, uh, sought in the wrong locations, um, costs that weren't anticipated. Um, all of these things that are really challenges in the system today. I'm very excited <clears throat> with machine learning and AI. My worry is that basic human nature, when you think about um, payers and then you think about providers, providers all believe that they have this wonderful data that's worth a lot of money that they don't really want to share. Payers say they've got all this data, but they don't want to share. The electronic health record entities say the same thing. And the patient says, yeah, it's my data. I don't know what to do with it. And so you've got this fundamental misconnect, and you'd word, used the word interoperability before, which is fundamentally we need to begin to figure out. I, I don't really, th and maybe this is heresy to say, but. I don't think the data belongs to the provider nor the payer. I think it belongs to the patient. And until we kind of get things set in terms of who, who, who has the data and how it can be used, which is stuff that you guys need to think about how th this needs to occur. Because if we don't do that, you know, we're never even gonna get close to the banking industry. And the banking industry has very complex, very private issues 
which they seem to have dealt with. I mean, I can go to the Czech Republic and I can get money, or I can see what my balance is in Bethesda, Maryland. It's like, okay. Um, I, I, and someone earlier today was talking about they had uh, data from 10 years before, but they didn't have data two years before. I mean, okay, that's, I would like to have my complete bank record, thank you. Um, so that, that's, that's how I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll build off both those points is, often with this is, I often have to sit down with other healthcare leaders and have the AI talk as, to some degree, and we'll go, what is it? I think the reality, like you're just stating, is this isn't about technology, this is really about human problems and how do we solve them. 30% mm -hmm. of this is technology, 70% of it is standards, incentives, organizational change, and how do we actually activate that? And that's really hard. It's really interesting. To, you can get excited about very interesting, attractive things like a, a digital doctor doing all these diagnoses, but at the end of the day, where we're really seeing a lot of the use cases is like you were saying, Ashley, the boring stuff. It's lots of back-end processes where the people are just have backlogs and grunting through rote work where the real thing is, well, how do we actually release that pressure and free up time? But, um, but, but the non-pressure part, I would say, would be the misaligned incentives. Oh, yeah, I completely agree. And that is something we should, as a society, be able to take care of. Yep. So, Brian, you know, the, the innovation challenge that I just attended was focused on AI. And, and I, I will tell you, I came back to the team, and I was enthused and also scared to death. Yep. Um, about what I saw, and the, one of the professors did that uh, segment on the, the progression of robotics, if you will, with the AI on top of it that could almost treat patients. Yep. And there was a discussion around how far is too far, um, and is that where we really want to go? Can you just talk a little bit about some of that and what we learned during that? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll reference maybe a couple key takeaways um, from that. One, and I would encourage all of you as just leaders to do this, one is I would encourage you all to invite AI to everything you do because we're at a unique moment where this acts as a co-intelligence. So actually I'll flip it where I'll flip the artificial intelligence and call it IA versus AI and go to it's really intelligent augmentation. And how do you actually augment all of the work we do and act as a complement in terms of how things go. But to do that, there's no manual for this. So like to figure out how to augment what your work is, you gotta go experiment, and you have to then lead from the front of how to do that. So if you're using Microsoft Copilot or Google Duet, any of these tools for just micro tasks in your day, it's one, just invite it and try to experiment. A second piece to that is the AI we have today is the worst it will ever be. And that is, you're, you could go to it and go, this is terrible, like this isn't gonna work, it's junk. Well guess what, four weeks from now, it's gonna be better. Four weeks after that, it's going to be better. And the pace of that acceleration um, is pretty, pretty intense. Um, so I think it's that, how do you get on that curve of actually experimenting? If I go where, I mean, it goes back to where we're seeing a lot of the activity is high value, high feasibility, low risk areas, which brings you to the back office. And then you have to experiment with higher risk areas um, to figure out what can be done. Now, to your point on human plus machine, a big part of this is how are you thinking what do we value as humans? And you need to elevate that. And where is the human connection valuable versus not? And that's where you have to rethink work and just your value prop. But other thoughts? Are you scared about any of that in clinical medicine? Am I scared? Um, no, because um, physicians are really underwater in terms of being able to look at all of the data I'm an oncologist. I mean, there are papers written that it would take the average oncologist 42 hours a week to keep up with what's happening in medical oncology now. I'm pretty sure they're not doing that. And so um, having tools that assist the, the general uh, decision making is important. I mean, your chat GPT said the biggest problem was um, pre-authorization. We haven't discussed pre-authorization. So, I mean, it's good, it's helpful. Yeah. I want to remember that, but there are deeper things that you want your clinician to be, be thoughtful of. And I think that's, that's where these tools become helpful. And, you know, something that's 
I think a lot of us are passionate about would be uh, social determinants of health. Uh, unless you've got tools like AI to really understand where the populations that you serve, who you can't see at the time because you're seeing the sick person in front of you, but you've got all of these other people who you need to be taken care of, but they're not in front of you, you need to know where they are. Mm -hmm. And you need to know what, how, how to deal with them. And a lot of it's not gonna be done by the physician, it's gonna be done by the system. Mm -hmm. So you need to build the system to make that work. So I find this to be just exciting. Mm -hmm. And to go back to what you said about engagement being so important, having that trusting relationship with your clinician, I mean, that requires a lot of follow-up and nudging toward behaviors that you'd like to see someone uh, making changes in their health around, but you can't do that day in and day out. And that's where I think there is power in some of this technology actually becoming that behavior change support an agent in someone's health journey. Um, and I think that's really powerful and I think we're just at the start of seeing how far we can go with that. I think building off this, one of the things we were discussing um, even ahead of this is there's lots of discussion about we have a clinical workforce problem, so to speak. Um, and what we know is we have two forces kind of operating together. We have an aging population that has higher utilizers of care, so we have more demand, and then shrinking supply. So we know that to be true. Historically, how healthcare you know, grew was adding labor. So we would add clinical labor to everything. We can't out-labor our way out of this one. We don't have enough people. Now, we have another problem, though, is we also added technology, and that led to negative productivity. I know, Roy, that was something we were mentioning, is <laughs> we haven't actually seen these gains. We have to solve this problem now, though. It's how do we actually reinvent work and actually figure out where can we shift tasks. Are there certain tasks that are lower value, less human, that we can shift to different levels of labor locally? What can we shift to machines? And how does that actually become the new care team is a big part of the challenge. And that will take a lot of time and trial and error. But so I think you know, the average banker is 30 years old. You know, the average physician is 59 years old. And no offense, those of us who are 59 and above, we're not exactly zealots when it comes to technology use. So we're gonna have to, we're gonna yeah. have to build that in because remember folks, um, I don't know who makes the greatest number of fax machines, it might be HP or something, but their biggest client base are physician offices. They're the only place that I still see or have even heard of that they're fax machines. But as you go to your doctor's office, just kind of, you know, you probably shouldn't do this, but if you walk in the back office and put your head and look around, you're going to see a fax machine just sitting there, just, you know, just going on the entire, the entire day as thousands of pages come in because then they are, you know, scanned as a PDF into the medical record and then forever lost. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So we know healthcare is actually big business in the U.S. Um, uh, it's actually a business based on human life. It's kind of scary to say that out loud. Um, but there is always and still is and always will be a steady demand for care. And in more cases, like I mentioned in the opening session, um, the supply of providers is just not possible um, to meet the demand. And that results in access issues, provider burnout, um, and then maybe even some new care models that may not even be effective. So should we continue to invest in the constant flow of innovation and transformation ideas in healthcare, or should we just redirect some of our time and energy back to the basics, back to just, we talked prior off, just the basic things that we know we still haven't gotten right in healthcare, and, and provider data quality. Uh, that's one that we've been talking about a lot here. Like, should we spend more time on the basics? I think we'd all probably say yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I really worry that so much of what we rely on is the trust that's built between a clinician and their patient, and we're eroding that 
little by little. Uh, I think the stat was 73% of people say that they do trust the opinion of their provider. And that, when we layer in all of the challenges that we put in front of someone, um, I think we're losing ground on that trust. And if we continue to not solve those root problems in someone's experience, um, people's expectations of other industries are incredibly high on customer service and immediacy of answers and information. And I, I think that we are essentially, um, we, we've kind of forced people to just give in and go, well, I don't know. I don't know how to navigate this and I'm just gonna get that surprise bill and that's just part of the experience. And I think it's incredibly sad, um, but if, we go back and say, all right, how do we take some of these technologies that might be incredibly exciting and then point them at the existing problems instead of getting a little bit of that shiny object syndrome that I think a lot of us get or the technology looking for a problem to solve, I, I think we'll be in a, a much better space in 10 years because we'll have gotten to those foundational elements that are actually driving people to disengage from the system. Go ahead. The basics are just so important. If you don't have an effective way of communicating with a patient, then no matter what we shiny object bring in terms of you know, tools for behavioral health or follow up for your chemotherapy or help for a, you know, um, a, a postmenopausal woman, if you can't communicate with the person, then why are you building all of these, this great technology? And we're still at, at the fundamental level of knowing where the patient is, you know, and there are so many basics that we don't collectively do well with. Mm -hmm. And organizations like yours, I think, become crucial given your data size and your ability to see, you know, very, very broadly and answer some fundamental questions. So I'm gonna go yes and to that one. I would state, um, and you kind of heard this even at the beginning, yes, there are some very real cost pressures on health plans and health systems right now, and there is a lot of innovation that needs to happen using even new and novel to tools, as we mentioned, on back-end administrative processes. Yes, you need to do that, and something like provider data quality is a good area of focus, a good place to start, high value, high feasibility, low risk, easy to tackle. However, you will also, you, you, we still need to think of how do we solve the and grapple with these problems and do things um, differently. Um, we, otherwise, I would say the change will happen to us regardless of if we want it or not. It's gonna happen. Even if we talk about, as we talk about reinventing work, work is always changing. So, and now it's just changing faster, so tech and talent are accelerating it. So if you go back 10 years ago, the tasks you're doing now are at least roughly 20% different than what they were 10 years ago. I don't know, again, if any of you are using like Microsoft 365, it's all cloud versions of Word, spreadsheets, or using any Google G Suite products. That's all cloud-based. 10 years ago, you didn't do that. So this is gonna diffuse, it's just we're seeing this pace being faster than we've seen. And I think maybe building Sarah off some of our prior things, there's a question of, okay, what more can you do now that you have these tools is a good question that you can't do today. That can be admin or non-admin, but what more can you do once you free up time? A second piece is, um, you know, what should you stop doing now that you have these particular tools and what can be offloaded to other um, functions becomes kind of key questions. And I would say taking a human-centered, I, I know we've said patient-centered, we've said provider-centered a lot. I'd say just generally human-centered approach yep. to looking at now these new emerging technologies and the problems we have right now. Um, I, I like to think of it as, you know, let's explore the problem spaces that exist and make sure that we're gonna make the right thing. And then once we understand that problem and understand how we might make the right thing, let's really co-create with the people who are encountering that problem to make sure we make the thing right. And that's really how we're gonna get to improving these basics, but applying these exciting new technologies in a way that's going to get adoption if it's yeah. from the provider or it's from the patient. 
But from the, the provider standpoint, I, I will tell you that there is chest pain associated with this conversation we just had. Yep. Because every single, every single physician says they're, you're here to make my life easier. It's kind of like what the government says, I'm here to make things better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what happens is you're taking more and more and more of my time yeah. to do something to help you, but it doesn't help me. And that gets back to your very first set of questions, which is, you know, how is this, are we gonna do more and more administrative time? So the, the answer, I think, is whatever we do, it's actually gonna be more efficient not just for the people paying the bills, but maybe for the yep. people who are rendering care, and oh, by the way, maybe the people receiving care. Mm -hmm. Agree. Well, I'll build up that, if, and if I'll go, what didn't happen historically, and maybe actually your point, what does need to happen? A lot of these were tools put on people, so I think there is a question is, what's the human problem? What's the human problem that a clinician is facing? How do you actually, and then how do you follow the principle of like, not for us, without us? It's then how do you co-create that solution with that person and then focus on leading with value. Those two things, finding valuable things that can offload to enrich it. We've seen that start to diffuse, but it's still early in that practice mm -hmm. of putting solutions in well, versus I'll, just adding. I'll give that. you a great example. Um, CAQH has been around a pretty long time, yep. about 25 years. And you know, we have two sides of business. We have the provider side and we have the member side. Um, we have the provider data management, we have the COB side. And the provider data management is a, is a payer bought solution, right? We, we, our customer is the health plans. However, the user is the provider at, or the provider's office staff, the administration. Yep. Designing the front end of our system should be through the lens of whoever is entering the data, yep. Yep. whoever is using it every day, making it easier for them to provide updates. Maybe it's an app. Maybe it's a different way for them to have access to that portal. That's what we are doing now. Yep. It is critically important that we design for the people that are using the system. Uh, we can't overlook the fact that there is value to those that are paying for the system. Yep. But if we want the engagement of, of the providers and we want to have the highest quality of data, we have to make it easier for those that are actually using it. And that gets to the design thinking. 100%. Yep. And in prior work, um, I had teams that were really digging into how can we get engagement from providers in new tools? And the big aha moment, which wasn't that aha, was you can't add something new to their workflow. You have to incorporate into an existing workflow that's part of what their expected pathway is, but then also you have to make that workflow better than it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Uh, to your point, Dr. Beveridge, it, it, you can't add more without bringing additional value. And I think that's the exciting part is we have tools that are in that workflow today. today. It's just how do we improve them to create greater engagement and then improve that data overall. Versus adding new tools yes. or changing tools. 100%. Let's make what, yep. what is there today even better and e even easier to use. Mm -hmm. yep. So, um, anything else you all want to add before we get to Q&A? Anything else? Okay. I forgot to do Q&A in the first session. <laughs> I'm not going to forget this time. So we'd love to open it up to some questions. We've got one over here, first person. No pressure. Hi, Brian, and everybody on the panel. Wonderful session. Thank you. Uh, my first question to Brian is uh, with the demand in uh, regulatory affairs and questions arising for a biased algorithms. Uh, what do you see the upcoming technologies like Gen AI and AI bridging the gap between provider and peer and a smoother flow of their work? Um, I mean, maybe I kind of go, we'll go back to some of the things I mentioned before. There is a big of where we're seeing things being applied is focusing on some of the administrative problems. So there is a thing of helping with regulatory com compliance, contract reviews, summarization, simplification on both sides of the equation. That's actually where it's high value, very feasible, low risk, yet there's lots of friction and pain. So right now, if we go with, well, where are we seeing lots of activity and investment? And where are we seeing results? It's actually a lot of it's in that 
those back office processes. Yeah. Um, I would say uh, I, I was part of a great conversation yesterday. Um, Tall from uh, Tennessee, BCBS Tennessee, uh, was talking about an implementation of CAQH's uh, provider product. And he talked about regulation in a way that I loved. He said they kind of, this is my words, not his, use those regulations as an opportunity to kind of pop the hood and go, okay, if we have to solve this problem, let's actually explore the problem space around it and say, we have to at least meet the intent of this regulation, but how do we actually take this as an opportunity to fundamentally improve the experience uh, around that problem? So I think it's maybe also shifting from, oh, we've just got to meet the minimum of this requirement, and instead trying to get to the intent and what problem is it trying to solve, and then maybe asking ourselves, how do we improve in a really meaningful way, the experience that we're bringing that might surround that regulatory uh, need. I'll, I'll build into a different twist on the regulatory question you asked. There is also a bit of a, with AI, what are the regulatory implications? A couple things we've started to see. One, because of the advancements, it does require organizations and so forth to really look at values and value in a very different way. Two, you are also seeing framework, regulatory frameworks come in trying to have responsible use. This has elevated the concept of responsible use up to boards and C-level because they realize this can't just be a data governance team in IT. It really comes down to, well, because you can do all these things, should you? What are your principles? Do you signal those to the market? Do you not? How does that then diffuse all the way down your operating mm -hmm. procedures? And then you are increasingly going to have to show your audit a bit, uh, that you are yeah. using things safely and responsibly back, and that's a big challenge. Second question over here. Good morning. Uh, Angie Evans from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. I'm interested in your perspective on how we better leverage uh, patient advocates. Um, I know that uh, for me personally, do a lot of advocacy on behalf of my parents who are elderly and have health care issues. And um, just making that connection between the patient and the advocate um, if it can't be a family member and that patient needs um, an advocate, how do we better leverage that to both bridge the care gap um, and to help uh, lessen the burden if we can on administrative tasks within the care team? So <clears throat> I'll just jump on this and I'll let you all follow up. We, we were just doing this little podcast earlier and we were talking about the fact that we use the term provider and everybody thinks physician or um, maybe a dentist or another clinician. And actually, when I say provider of care, that could mean a family member, that could mean a patient advocate, that could be anybody that is delivering care to someone, any type of support. Um, and so I'm a big believer, and we've got to acknowledge that and accept that there are so many people all over the world that are providing care, may not be degreed in that way. Um, and then how do you create a community for those people that are providing that type of care and support um, more uh, consciously? So that's just my opinion. I just wanted to get that one out there because I do feel that we miss it. We just miss it in the world today. Yeah. I think also under that umbrella, could be community-based organizations that ultimately are meeting some of those SDOH needs in the marketplace too that um, we know fundamentally are also impacting health. It's, it's, it's a cycle. Um, and so I think some of the challenge, and this came up in a session yesterday as well, is how do we even start data sharing and having interoperability with some of these organizations that are supporting other elements of people's lives. It's really their entire health journey. And I think those caregivers that might be a part of an ancillary service um, are just as important to understand insights about people's health, but then um, also be in that loop about someone's uh, journey that they can also kind of find the right spots and trigger into the right spots to bring that, uh, that care when they need it. I'll just go, this could be its own sidebar because that's a big topic about patient advocacy because, I mean, there's big social issues. How do you, should there be payment for this because there's a massive support? Um, 
I think it does fit with how to improve things does come back to things, Ashley, you were saying, and we've stated is, okay, if we're thinking through solutions, how do we think of the human backward, which includes the person, but also the circle around them, including caregivers, how do we back in and then create solutions to do that? Some of that is increasingly needed because we also need to shift tasks more to the person in home, not to increase burden, but how do you do so in a way that actually um, doesn't overburden what's already tough? Um, so I think it kind of starts with their, that and backs, backs into it. And then side, separately, we'll have to talk more of the you know, regulatory payment issues. That's a separate discussion, but there's a lot. But I think that bespeaks the importance of regulation yep. and getting societal acceptance of you know, what is permissible and what's not. So yep. what might be permissible in the EU might be quite different than what uh, Americans, yep. North Americans would accept. Yep. We've got one more question. He promised to be quick. <laughs> all right, well, I appreciate such a wonderful panel and all of your time to make it quick. I'm a pharmacist and in community pharmacies, we see a lot of patients who are, are not really a part of the system. You don't get their data. And I don't think mm -hmm. that a lot of the systems and the big data we have captures these patients. So as we are building our system and improving it using this data, how do we make sure that we're not edging those patients out? You asked the easy question at the end, yeah, thank yeah. you. Oh, the easy closer, yeah, yeah. Um, so first of all, let me say, um, pharmacists are providers of care too. And that's something else that we don't talk a lot about in the US, I just came back from leading um, healthcare in Canada for Shoppers Drug Mart. And we did a lot of work to create pharmacist-led clinics. Um, the scope of practice is a little bigger in Canada than it is in the US. And it was quite amazing what pharmacists are allowed to do and can do in Canada. So I just want to acknowledge that what pharmacists do in the US as well in the community defined exactly what you just mentioned to identify some of the gaps that are happening, whether it's in care or in the data, is super important, so I just want to thank you. Um, and I do believe that we have to do better to find those different places that are interacting with patients. It's not going into a system someplace, so it's mining information that's not in a system, and that's a different type of third-party data, if you will, that we have to get better at. And I don't have an answer on that yet. Yeah. I similarly don't have an answer, but I go, this does play back into the critical and urgent need for more effort in responsible use of data and AI specifically that we need to also do as society. I will state, you know, we're decades into digital change and we've kind of kicked this can for some time um, and we can't really hit that anymore. I will go, as you move into more data collection and more algorithms, you really need to think of who is collecting the data and creating stuff, what data was collected and what's missing and what the algorithms do, and what are the implications, and how do you close those gaps? Because there are some real gaps and challenges in data. But this but, is us society. But yeah. I, I think when you recognize that Medicaid patients go in and out of the system very frequently, we lose, we don't know what's happening with those folks when they leave the system, which is part of what you're talking about here. And so it's having a, a combined system that's looking at people who are going in and out of the system is part of the answer because, I mean, then they go to exchanges, Medicaid, you know, uninsured. It's, it, it's a very complicated question that you just asked. Yeah, it's a good one. We need another sidebar. Yeah, another sidebar. <laughs> okay, am I good? Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for participating. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you.